Thank you very much. Thank you, Taylor. I'm very honored and very pleased to see this distinguished group that has come together to listen to this mayor talk about growth and Seattle's future. I want to start by thanking you all for coming. It is an impressive and diverse group. Looking around, I see a lot of familiar faces who will be helping us in this process and giving us guidance. But I'm willing to bet that not all of us have all been in the same room at the same time. I see neighborhood activists and advocates, homeless activists, directors of nonprofit agencies, directors of major corporations, developers, environmentalists, legislators, and lawyers, and many, many others. There are also so a lot of people here who have spent countless hours helping to develop this vision. First of all, the Seattle Planning Commission. They have done a yo person's job in this whole effort. The Framework Policy Citizen Advisory Committee, and especially all the talented people who have been a part of the Seattle Planning Department. I want to personally thank all of you for your insights and for your dedication. It's appropriate that we have such a diverse group here today because this issue affects everyone, both in Seattle and across the Puget Sound region. And I'm here today to deliver a very simple warning. Unless we change direction, Seattle and the entire Puget Sound region are on a collision course with the future of a lower standard of living, lower environmental quality, and the loss of all the values we treasure about this region. Let me tell you where I fear that we're heading. Unless we change direction and soon, I believe we're headed for a future of urban sprawl all across Puget Sound, from the high tide mark to the foothills of the Cascades. Maybe we will build an expensive light rail system, but our freeways will still be clogged with cars because most people don't live close enough to the stations to make them worthwhile. More and more people will be forced to move out of Seattle, especially families with children, because housing opportunities are limited and supply and demand has pushed prices out of sight. The exodus of the middle income families will leave Seattle, mainly a city for the rich, the poor, the childless, and single. The loss of middle income families will go hand in hand with a decline in the quality of Seattle schools. As more families are forced out of the city, support for the schools will dry up. The resulting loss of quality will lead even more families to leave the city, creating a vicious cycle of decline. 95% of the cars on the road will contain only a single passenger. Senior citizens and other individuals with respiratory problems will be confined to their houses three days out of every month due to declining air quality. Failing schools, perpetual gridlock, and the destruction of our once pristine environment will lead many companies across to cross Seattle off their list of places to locate new clean industry. Stagnant economic growth will mean many of our young people must look outside the region to find work. Homelessness, unemployment, AIDS, and other social problems will continue to rise, but the city and the region will be powerless to do anything about them due to a lack of revenue to support even the basic government services. Now, I know that there are some reporters in the room, so let me stress this is not my preferred alternative for <laughs> Seattle's future. But I believe it will be our future maybe 20 years down the road, maybe 40 years down the road, but it will be our future unless we take decisive, difficult, and in some cases, politically unpopular action now. There is still time to change our course, but time is running out. Recently, I had the opportunity to fly over Seattle in a helicopter for a first-hand look at the potential impact of the proposed high-capacity transit lines. That trip made a strong impression on me. It got me thinking about what I'd like to see if I made a similar trip 20 years from now. And let me outline that vision for you because it is a very different picture than the nightmare I described just moments ago. First of all, I wouldn't start by flying over the city. I'd start by taking a quick look at King County and the rest of the Puget Sound region. 
I'd want to see large areas of open space, wetlands, agriculture, and forest lands left in the Puget Sound Basin. I'd want to see most of our region's population clustered in cities and towns to promote an effective transportation network and preserve natural spaces. Most of all, in the year 2010, I'd want to see the visible evidence that all the talk about regionalism in the 1980s and 90s was not just rhetoric. I'd want to see proof that decisions on density, growth, transportation, and other re issues were made in a regional context, not on the basis of dozens of jurisdictions acting independently to grab all the benefits of growth while pushing the costs off on somebody else. Having looked at the region as a whole in 2010, I turn my attention to Seattle itself. What would I see? I'd want to see many of our neighborhoods looking much as they do today. Single family neighborhoods, each with its own unique personality and character. I'd want to see a city where people saw every neighborhood as a great place to own a home, operate a business, or raise a family. Thanks to a concerted investment of public resources, incentives for private investment, and a strong partnership between the community and city government. I'd want to see greater integration along racial, ethnic, and economic lines as a result of direct efforts to promote neighborhood diversity and the reduction of past disparities or even perceived disparities among neighborhoods. And I'd want to see brand new neighborhoods, urban villages in key locations like South Lake Union around the Kingdom at Northgate and at key transportation nodes along the Rainier Corridor. I'd want to see families and children returning to Seattle drawn by more affordable housing, steadily improving schools, parks, libraries, recreation centers, and a truly quality urban life. I'd want to see fewer cars on the road and more people moving around by bus, rail, bicycles, or just plain walking. I want to see new clean industry at strategic locations throughout the city, either homegrown or drawn here by our highly skilled workforce or well-developed economic infrastructure and our healthy environment, which would still be the envy for the rest of the nation. And finally, I want to see a strong sense of community purpose, a willingness to address the social needs like affordable housing, education, job training, AIDS prevention and treatment, and family support services. Now, some people might say this vision is impossible, a pipe dream. Well, I say it's our only hope. I say that as a community, we have only two choices. We can either control growth or we can let growth control us. We can either take control of growth and channel it it in ways that will enhance our community or we can sit on our hands and watch unmanaged growth destroy all of the things that we value about Seattle and the Puget Sound region. Now I know this may not be a popular view in some circles, but I do not believe we should try to stop growth. Frankly, we probably couldn't even if we wanted to. I think we need continued economic growth in the Puget Sound region to provide jobs and opportunity for our children, to provide resources and revenue for our schools and programs. But I do believe we must control growth and direct it in ways that reflect our goals and concerns as a community. And that's really what we're talking about here today. How do we get a handle on growth and force growth to occur in ways that enhance rather than destroy our community? How do we find the political will to say no to powerful forces and entrenched interests that will change our region in ways that we don't want? How do we create an environment where politicians are willing to take tough stands, the potentially risky and unpopular stands, to preserve what's good about our region and channel growth to make our community even better? Here in Seattle, we've started a process to do just that. It's called Seattle 2010, and it's, it's, it's designed to develop a comprehensive plan 
to shape the course of our city for the next 20 years. We want to create a plan that will direct everything from growth, housing, cultural opportunities, social services, environmental quality, everything that will affect the future of this community. But before I get too far, I want to tip my hat off to a person who first introduced the idea of such a comprehensive planning process, my colleague on the Seattle City Council, Jim Street. In a way, it's fitting that Jim and I should be working so closely on this effort, because for the past two years, we've worked shoulder to shoulder on efforts to improve our educational systems. We still got more work to do in that arena, but this planning effort represents the logical next step what kind of community will we pass on to our children? Developing a comprehensive plan for the city's future is an effort that will extend over the next two years. So today I'm unveiling the first step in that process. It's called the Mayor's Preferred Alternative Framework Policies. Now what does that mean? Well, before we can develop a comprehensive plan with specific policies to govern every aspect of public policy for the next 20 years, we all have to agree on where we want to go. And that's the framework policies. The framework policies are the blueprint for our entire comprehensive plan. So today I want to share with you my vision for what we need to be, where we need to be going as a city and as a region over the next 20 years but I can't claim sole credit for this vision. It was shaped over the past year by hundreds of meetings with community groups and individuals. We reached out to groups that had never had a voice in city planning. Homeless men and women, non-English speakers, high school students, American Indians, Southeast Asian refugees, and many, many others. And through those meetings, we identified what were the core values that define our collective goals for the future. Security, freedom, progress, opportunity, diversity, community, continuity, environment, and good government. Those core values form the basis for all of our deliberations over the past few months, and they form the basis of my proposed vision for Seattle's future. Finding those core values is important because developing a long-term vision forces all of us to dig deep inside. What do we really care about? Why is this so important? You know, as I wrestled with the policy questions facing the region, I kept coming back to two basic central themes. Preserving a place in our community for our children and our elders and protecting our Northwest environment because it's all about family. Anyone who knows me knows that I care a lot about children and anyone who knows me knows how much my mother and my grandmother have shaped my life. I don't wanna see a community that loses its ability to embrace our young people and our elders and I don't wanna see our children forced to leave their community in order to find a job or an affordable home. I don't want to see seniors like my mother forced out of their homes or forced out of their community by economic or social pressures. It's tribal. The day that Seattle loses its ability to sustain our children and our elders is the day we become just another city instead of a true community. It's also about our relationship with the water and the forests and the mountains. I want all of our children to have the opportunity to experience the natural wonder we enjoy, to feel their linkages with the water and the weather to sense the unfathomable power of salmon returning to spawn after years at sea, to have mountains and forests as anchors in their souls. It's spiritual. We are only stewards of our land and water and air and wildlife. The environment is not ours to destroy for our convenience or profit. We have a sacred obligation to protect the environment, to share its wonders with future generations. These are the values that drove me as I developed my vision for the future of this community. They are the touchstones that have guided me throughout this process. And that process has resulted in a 
150-page document that we're releasing today, which spells out my vision in fine detail, as well as several other alternatives. Over the next few months, this document will be the subject of workshops, hearings, and council debate, and I urge all of you to make your voices heard. And I don't believe that you'll be stopped. I can't possibly tell you everything in just 30 minutes, so I want to tell you the principles that are the core of this proposal. So think of this speech as cliff notes. <laughs> and if you want all the detail and substance, you have to read the whole book. <laughs> Principle number one, to create the Seattle we all want in the future, we must start by preserving many of the values and features that exist in our city today. Because I think that's what scares people most about the future, it's change. People see powerful forces changing their community and they wonder where it will stop. It's our values, compassion, openness, diversity, independence, determination, generosity. These values are reflected in the physical features that define our communities, our residential neighborhoods, and our healthy business districts. Fremont, Wallingford, Mount Baker, West Seattle, Madrona, Ravenna, Beacon Hill, East Lake, Rainier Beach, Ballard, Seward Park, Del Ridge, Greenwood, and the list goes on and on. Each with their own unique character, each with their own feel. Any blueprint for the future has to start by recognizing these unique features and these unique treasures and taking strong steps to preserve them. Principle number two, we've got to address every planning decision from the perspective of environmental stewardship. I want our children to have the same opportunity we had to experience the wonders of nature and this region. We need to stop urban sprawl and preserve our dwindling open space by channeling growth into already developed areas. In recent years, we've lost open space and farmland in King County at an unbelievable rate. Most of the population growth in the county has occurred outside of the city of Seattle and outside of the other major towns and cities. Many areas that look rural today are in fact platted lots which might be developed in the future. We cannot allow that trend to continue or we'll see every acre of available land swallowed up by urban sprawl. We've got to focus the county's population growth into already built areas. And I believe that Seattle can and must show regional leadership by saying we can accept more than our proportional share of the growth that's going to occur in the years ahead. Now having said that, we cannot take all that growth if we rely on a business as usual when it comes to land use patterns and development. We've got to focus growth within the city as well to protect our single family neighborhoods and our neighborhood business districts and in our in-city open space and other environmental values. Principle number three, we need to develop a truly comprehensive transportation system that will support a healthy community but get people out of their single passenger cars. In our community meetings, we heard this theme again and again. Mobility is truly a key to the quality life of this city. Now, for some, the word mobility means one thing, a $12 billion light rail system. But when you st stop and think about it, that light rail proposal is only a partial solution at best. Yes, we need high capacity, a high-capacity transit mechanism, that will move large numbers of people quickly and efficiently into downtown and back to the suburbs. Yes, we need high capacity transit mechanisms that will connect five or six major hubs in our city, plus the downtown core. But the current proposed light rail package alone is not going to answer all of our transportation needs or even most of them. Maybe we do need a light rail system but what we really need is a comprehensive solution to our transportation and land use problems. On the transportation side, we, I would agree that we need some form of high capacity transit to move large numbers of people quickly and efficiently between residential and commercial centers. That could be light rail 
or we might be able to accomplish the same goal at far less expense through dedicated bus service. But high capacity transit is only one piece of the transportation puzzle. We need dramatic improvements in our circulator buses. We need to look at returning to trolleys to connect various points in our city. We need to dedicate more of our highway and arterials to HOV lanes to provide visible concrete incentives for carpooling and to penalize single occupancy vehicles. We need continued improvement and expansion of our urban bicycle trail system, including one or more dedicated bicycle lanes through our downtown core. And we need to understand the link between land use, urban design, and transportation. We need to encourage development that renders cars unnecessary. We need to encourage development that makes it possible to walk between work, home, and services. There's no question that this region needs to make a major investment in the transportation infrastructure in the years ahead. The real question is whether a $12 billion light rail system is the way to go. I'm encouraged that Metro is already looking at ways to scale back the project, to cut costs, but maintain the vast majority of potential riders. We need to take that analysis even further. Let's assume that our region has the will to make a major investment in mo mobility. Let's take the time we need to explore the options, to ensure that we get the benefit of every dollar spent. Principle number four, to preserve environmental values throughout the region, Seattle can accommodate more residential growth, but growth must be accompanied by the proper infrastructure and amenities. Increased growth does not have to equal declining quality of life. But that is only true if we plan for growth by creating the infrastructure to sustain the community. And I'm defining infrastructure today very broadly. Not just sewers and roads, but schools, parks, libraries, recreation centers, open spaces, and much more. Because my basic point is this. To accommodate growth and protect our existing neighborhoods, and our open spaces, we need to create new urban villages. And when I talk about new urban villages, I mean places where people could live, work, shop, play, and go to school all within walking distance. Places where children, senior citizens, families of all ages and incomes can feel at home. Places with a wide range of housing intermingled to create a diverse and vibrant community, places with a high, fairly high population density, but a wonderful quality of life, thanks to carefully planned amenities like parks, libraries, play fields, retail shops, and other things that make a true community. Places where you could leave your car in the garage for a month or do with it all together and never even notice it places where high capacity transit, buses, bicycle trails, and walking all mesh together to create an effective transportation network. By channeling growth to these urban villages, we can preserve our existing single family neighborhoods. We can accommodate population growth and do it in a way that enhances the city's character and quality of life. Where could these new neighborhoods be? Obviously, that's a question for more study, more planning, and more design. But I can certainly foresee new urban villages in the South Lake Union area, or near the King Dome, or Northgate, or around the major transportation hubs in Southeast Seattle. Principle number five. Our future depends on leadership with the political will to recognize and balance the needs of the entire region. We need to see ourselves as part of a larger region, and we need to ensure that regionalism is a two-way street. Yes, I believe Seattle can accommodate a greater share of growth projected for this region and do it in a way that enhances our quality of life. But in return, we need some things from the county and the region as a whole. We need the county to ensure that leadership will be present to hold the line 
on the urban growth boundary. Nothing Seattle can do will prevent urban sprawl from destroying our regional environment if the county does not restrict development outside the existing urban area. We need regional funding to create incentives for more compact residential development within Seattle and other population centers, which is so critical to preserving open space throughout the region. And we need to recognize the unique burdens that Seattle is forced to shoulder and the load that we take off their backs. Seattle has always been the focus of a disproportional share of human needs in this region. And there is a natural gravitation of unemployed, homeless, poor, and other disadvantaged individuals to the central city in search of jobs, services, or a more accepting community. Recently, we have begun to see some suburban communities begin to tackle some of these pressing issues, particularly in the area of youth services, but an enormous disparity still remains. This region needs to recognize the unique role that Seattle plays, and the region needs to be more of a partner with Seattle. We need more resources and more support, or else we cannot continue to meet those needs indefinitely. And finally, we need to resolve our differences over the form of regional government so that we can get on with the real issues, the substance of regional government. To create the future we all want will take more than just a vision or where we want to go. We will need some specific policies to take us there. To preserve our dwindling wetlands, farmlands, and open spaces, for example, we need the county to show political will and vigorously enforce the urban growth boundary. In extreme cases, Seattle could potentially refuse to provide water service to developments that are not consistent with the urban growth boundary or the county's overall growth plan. To promote development of new urban villages, we could increase public investment in infrastructure and amenities in specific areas to encourage families and businesses to locate in these areas. We need to ensure the school district's massive capital plan is consistent with the city's overall development goals so that we can link up schools, libraries, community centers, play fields, and other investments. Combining these plans and facilities can help create our new urban villages and maximize the benefits of our taxpayer dollars. We need to take a close look at our development review process and adopt policies which would streamline the process for projects in areas targeted as new urban villages. These are just a few of the examples and the point is clear. Once we determine the direction we want to go, there are a number of concrete policy levers we can use to get there, if we have the creativity and the political will to use them. Achieving this vision I've outlined is not going to be easy. It will require significant changes from existing policy, but these are the kinds of steps we must take to retain Seattle as a livable community. There will be people who won't like this plan, Having said that, I don't believe that planning for our future has to be a zero-sum game. I do not believe we have to choose between a strong economy and a healthy environment. I don't believe we have to choose between affordable housing for our children and our elderly and preserving neighborhood character. I do not believe that in every planning decision someone has to win and someone has to lose. I say we can do it better. And I say there's room within my vision of the future for almost every member of Seattle's family to find a place. For neighborhood activists, my plan would provide a way to preserve our precious single family neighborhoods and empower residents by giving neighborhoods more of a voice over development and design standards. For environmentalists, my plan would provide a way to preserve air quality and focus our region's growth into existing developed areas to protect our dwindling green spaces, farmlands, and wildlife habitat. For young families, my plan would ensure that they are not priced out of Seattle's future by creating affordable housing and family-oriented housing in new multi-use neighborhoods. For our children who worry whether they will be able to find a job my plan would ensure that our economy continues to grow in ways that are consistent with other goals. 
for advocates concerned about AIDS and infant mortality or other health issues, my proposal envisions the development of a comprehensive community-based health care strategy with an emphasis on outreach and prevention to address these issues that the federal government has seemed to turn its back on. And for our elderly, my plan will ensure that they can stay near their families and stay in their community as they grow older and not be forced out. In my mind, the planning process provides Seattle with a tremendous opportunity. For too long, our leaders have tended to separate issues and policies into neat little boxes. For too long, people have tended to think about physical planning, social services, transportation, and every other issue as a separate entity. Look at the Democratic presidential primary. You've got the candidate who's got the tough economic message. You've got the candidate who has the tough environmental message. And then you've got the candidate who's got all the delegates. <laughs> Maybe that's... Maybe that's because he comes the closest to encompassing all of the concerns and aspirations the voters feel. My proposal is driven by a belief that you cannot separate human development from physical development. You cannot separate education from the environment, from the economy, and pursue each of them separately. To maintain and enhance our quality of life in this region, we've got to learn to see the connections between all of these issues. We've got to build a vision for the future that encompasses all of the factors that add up to a quality urban environment. And we... <laughs> That's mom. <laughs> and we've got to change the way we think about change itself. Right now, there's a whole lot of people all across the Puget Sound region who are concerned about change and are spending an enormous amount of energy trying to prevent bad things from happening. I say we need to shift our focus. We can't spend all of our time just digging in our hills and trying to prevent bad things from happening. We've got to spend some time and energy trying to make good things happen. Now that may sound simple. <laughs> that may sound simple. But it's one of the greatest threats to the continued quality of life in our region. Growth is a great example of how we tend to focus on preventing bad things from happening instead of working to ensure the good things. Growth has become the dirty word to a lot of people in this community. And in some cases, they're right. If growth means ugly, overpriced, four-story, one-bedroom apartment buildings taking over half of a single-family neighborhood in this city, then I agree growth is bad. But if growth means well-planned, multi-use neighborhoods sprouting in an area of our city where there used to be vacant lots, abandoned buildings, crumbling infrastructure, and no economic opportunity for our kids, then it's a very different story. And if growth means families coming back to Seattle with their children and their grandparents, then that kind of growth I'll take any day. I say it's time to stop spending all of our energy to stop the wrong kind of growth the wrong kind of change. Let's put our energy into promoting the right kind of growth, the right kind of change, and think about it. If we can channel growth into positive outcomes, then that in itself will take the pressure off the negative growth we all fear. Instead of constantly holding back or being on the defensive because we're afraid of any kind of change, let's take the offensive and create the kind of community we all want. I truly believe that Seattle is one of America's last and best hopes for creating an extraordinary urban quality of life. But I also believe that the sand is running out of the hourglass. Unless we take strong, decisive action now, we're headed for a future of urban sprawl. Unless we take strong, decisive action now, we may as well roll out a replica of Los Angeles from Puget Sound to the Cascades from Everett to Olympia. But that grim prospect does not have to be our future as a city or as a region. We have it in our own hands to create our future. A future with Seattle as the center of a healthy, environmentally sound region. A future where there are actually more open spaces and more recreation areas. A future of vibrant, pedestrian-oriented urban villages. A future where the most vulnerable among us are children and elders and those who are afflicted have respect and opportunity, 
a future where we are investing in people and community and not just hardware, a people where there are jobs waiting for our children and our schools are actually preparing our kids to take those jobs. That's my vision for the future of our community. But to make this vision a reality, we're going to need the full and active support of the entire community. In the weeks ahead, I'm going to be taking this vision out to the community and forums all across this city. I've shared this vision with my department heads, with their managers, and the mandate is that they are to be out there working and showing you how it can work. So in closing, I want to leave you with one of my favorite parables. It takes an entire village to educate a single child. As we've seen over the past two years, education is not one dimensional. We need to approach education in a holistic sense and bring every community resource to bear on the challenge in the same way that it takes an entire community to create a livable future. We cannot approach this task one dimensionally. We need to understand all the factors that add up to the region's quality of life and we need to involve our entire community in charting our future course. I am asking you to join me in this effort and if we can join together to make this vision a reality, we will create a lasting legacy for our children and our future generations, and it will be a model for the rest of the nation to follow. Thank you very much.